Welcome everyone to a very special session at Let's Talk Clots. My name's Laura Roberts. I'm a haematologist at King's College Hospital in London. And, and I hope you've all been enjoying the four incredible days of learning that we've had on this conference. We're really now going to end on a high with a masterclass looking at the new anticoagulants on the horizon and how they might bring improved prevention, safety and outcomes in venous thromboembolism. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Jeff Whites to present and discuss news at 11, moving beyond the directoral anticoagulants. Professor Whites, a professor of medicine, biochemistry and biomedical sciences at McMaster University, executive director of the Thrombosis and Atherosclerosis Research Institute and past president of the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. His research spans the spectrum from basic studies in the biochemistry of blood coagulation and fibrinolysis to animal models of thrombosis and on to clinical trials of antithrombotic therapy. The breadth of his work is highlighted by his over 640 publications and 76 book chapters. He's a recipient of numerous awards. Professor Weitz was appointed as an officer of the Order of Canada and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. There will be an opportunity to ask questions, so please do use the Q&A button to put these in as the talk is presented. And we look forward to discussing as many of these as possible. I'm looking forward to this immensely, so let's pass over to Professor Weitz. Thank you very much, and it's my distinct pleasure to be here to present to you on World Thrombosis Day. So I am going to talk about the factor 11 inhibitors in particular today. And before we get started, let me show you my disclosures. I'll give you a moment to read them. What I'm going to talk about in the next 20 minutes or so is I'm going to talk about the new targets for anticoagulants, the drugs that address these targets, and the potential new indications for these new agents. So if we step back for a moment, we're all aware that the direct oral anticoagulants or the DOAX are a huge advance over vitamin K antagonists such as warfarin. For stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation, the DOACs are at least as effective, but they're associated with about a 50% reduction in the risk of the most feared complication of anticoagulation, and that's intracranial hemorrhage. On the VTE side, when compared with what was then the standard of care, which was a heparin, usually low molecular weight heparin, bridging to a vitamin K antagonist, the direct oral anticoagulants at least as effective as warfarin for preventing recurrence, but they're associated with a 40% reduction in major bleeding. And of course, they have the convenience advantage over direct or over uh, vitamin K antagonists because they can be given in fixes and don't require monitoring. So with these advantages, why do we need new oral anticoagulants? If we step back for a moment and think about the goal of anticoagulant therapy, it's really to attenuate, attenuate thrombosis without increasing the risk of bleeding. And although the DOACs come closer to this goal than the vitamin K antagonists, we still have a ways to go. There's less intracranial bleeding with the DOACs, but still the annual rates of major bleeding remain at about two to 3% in the AF population. And the rates of major and clinically relevant non-major bleeding are in the range of 10 to 12% per year. So there still is room for improvement. And we feel this in that the fear of bleeding, both on the physician side and on the patient side, leads to the underuse of anticoagulants for stroke prevention, atrial fibrillation. Even the most recent registries suggest that 30 to 
of eligible patients with atrial fibrillation still are not getting anticoagulant thromboprophylaxis. And even when DOACs are prescribed, there's inappropriate use of the low dose DOAC regimens in the mistaken hope that using a lower dose will reduce the risk of bleeding. And in fact, it doesn't, but it does increase the risk of stroke. So how can we do better? Well, the, the, the DOAX, uh, either the thrombin inhibitor, dabigatran, or the factor 10A inhibitors, apixaban, rivaroxaban, and nadoxaban, target enzymes in the common pathway of coagulation, either 10A or thrombin. We're now moving upstream to look at the contact system. Remember that blood coagulation can be triggered via two distinct pathways, via the tissue factor pathway. This is the pathway that is initiated when tissue factor is exposed, for example, at the site of a plaque rupture. And we have the contact pathway. This is the pathway that's initiated when blood comes into contact with uh, foreign surfaces. This could be a stent, a mechanical heart valve, a catheter, dialysis circuit, all of this leads to activation through the contact pathway. Now, if we move to the contact pathway and inhibit factors in that location, then we have the potential to attenuate thrombosis without disruption of hemostasis. Why is this? Well, because we know that factor 12 deficiency is not associated with the bleeding diathesis. And patients with congenital factor 11 deficiency, they rarely have spontaneous bleeding, although they can bleed with surgery or trauma. Now, most of the attention has focused on factor 11 because it's uh, associated with uh, thrombosis in that people with congenital factor 11 deficiency are protected from thrombosis and individuals with high factor 11 levels are at increased risk of thrombosis. And factor 11 has a differential role in thrombosis and hemostasis. So if we look here at this side of the screen, we're looking at hemostasis. Hemostasis is the formation of a hemostatic plug that seals holes in blood vessels usually in blood vessels that are cut from the outside to the inside. The blood vessel is surrounded by a hemostatic envelope of tissue factor. And when this envelope is disrupted, there is exposure of this tissue factor to the blood and formation of this predominantly extravascular clot to plug the seal. Now this large amount of tissue factor triggers explosive thrombin generation to form this hemostatic plug. You can almost think about it as a prothrombin time. We add prothrombinase, uh, thromboplastin, sorry, we add thromboplastin to the plasma to trigger the prothrombin time. And that thromboplastin, which is tissue factor, causes the plasma to clot in about 12 seconds. That's as fast as we can get fibrinogen transformation to fibrin monomers and fibrin monomers to polymerize. In this explosive formation of fibrin, feedback activation of factor 11 by thrombin is rarely needed. Contrast to thromb that to thrombosis, where there is formation of an intravascular clot that's triggered by small amounts of tissue factor. On the arterial side, this might be the tissue factor that's exposed in the core of an atherosclerotic plaque when it ruptures. And in the vein, this might be the tissue factor expressed on the surface of activated monocytes that get tethered to the activated endothelial cell wall. This small amount of tissue factor produces uh, factor 10A and thrombin, 
But in order for this thrombus to grow beyond the site of tissue factor exposure, thrombin has to feed back, activate factor 11 to generate more 10A and more thrombin and to cause this thrombus to grow and fill the lumen of the vessel and obstruct blood flow. So factor 11 is essential for thrombosis, but mostly dispensable for hemostasis. And for this reason, inhibiting factor 11 has the potential to really get us closer to that holy grail of attenuating thrombosis without disruption of hemostasis. Now we have a large amount of evidence supporting factor 11 as a target. As I said, people with genetic deficiency of factor 11, and this is a common disorder in certain populations. It occurs, for example, in one in 450 Ashkenazi Jews. And factor 11 deficiency is associated with a reduced risk of thrombosis. And these individuals rarely experience spontaneous bleeding. Genetic epidemiology studies in large cohorts have shown us that low levels of factor 11 provides protection against venous thromboembolism and ischemic stroke. And high factor 11 levels are associated with an increased risk of these thrombotic disorders. And finally, in animal studies in rodents and non-human primates, have shown us that if you inhibit factor 11 or if you knock out factor 11, thrombosis at sites of arterial or venous injury is attenuated. But no matter which bleeding model is attempted, there's no increase in bleeding. This is different from what we saw with the direct oral anticoagulants in animal models with the direct oral anticoagulants. As you increase the dose of the DOAC, there was a greater and greater antithrombotic effect, but there also was more and more bleeding. Now, there are a number of strategies that are being investigated to target factor 11. These include antisense oligonucleotides that reduce the hepatic synthesis of factor 11, thereby lowering factor 11 levels in the circulation. There are antibodies that bind to factor 11 or to factor 11A and block its activation or activity. And finally, there are small molecules, which like the DOACs, bind reversibly to the active site of factor 11A and block its activity. Now this uh, rather busy slide just shows you the intense activity around factor 11 inhibition with various agents and the diseases that are being targeted with this new class of agents. These include atrial fibrillation, prior stroke, end-stage kidney disease with patients on hemodialysis, acute coronary syndrome, total knee arthroplasty, and the patients with cancer-associated venous thromboembolism. So a lot of activity with a variety of different agents. And we're going to drill, drill down on some of the phase two data. Now, development, development of new uh, anticoagulants usually starts in the orthopedic patient population, often in patients undergoing knee replacement surgery. Why do we do the studies in this population? Because these patients are at risk for post-operative deep vein thrombosis. And even with anticoagulant thromboprophylaxis, such as with low molecular weight heparin like enoxaparin, there still is a rate of breakthrough DVT of about 25% that can be detected by venography of the operated leg. So this is a very efficient way to test different doses of a new anticoagulant compared with a gold standard. 
and to determine which doses have antithrombotic activity. And also the safety of the agents can be tested because these patients have just undergone major surgery. So we can look for excess bleeding at the operative site. Now studies have been conducted comparing the antisense oligonucleotide, the ASO, asosumab, that's an antibody that blocks factor 11A activity, abelasumab, this is an antibody that binds to factor 11 and blocks its activation by both factor 12A and thrombin, and milvexian, this is a small molecule inhibitor of factor 11A. And if we look at this meta-analysis of these studies, where the 11 inhibitor was compared with enoxaparin, we see that the factor 11 inhibitors were associated with a significant reduction in the risk of VTE after the surgery, and also with about a 60% reduction in the risk of clinically relevant bleeding, which the, is the composite of major and clinically relevant non-major bleeding. So this speaks to the promise of factor 11 inhibitors as agents that can do better than what we have now and do it more safely. Now let's first uh, drill down to asundexian, one of the small molecule factor 11A inhibitors. It's given orally. After oral administration, the uh, blood levels peak in about one to four hours, which is just what we get with DOAC, such as apixaban or rivaroxaban. The half-life is 14 to 21 hours, which enables once a day dosing. And the phase two program focused on atrial fibrillation, stroke, and acute myocardial infarction. This program was called the Pacific Program, and it, it enrolled about 4,000 patients. If we look first at the Pacific AF study, Here's the study design. Patients with atrial fibrillation were randomized to one of two doses of asundexian, either 20 or 50 milligrams once a day, or to a pixaban at the usual dose regimen. Patients were treated for three months, so just a short duration of treatment. Only 750 patients in the study, so this study is underpowered for efficacy but it was designed mainly to address safety and the primary outcome was the composite of major or clinically relevant non-major bleeding. And here we see the results. Uh, there were no major bleeds in this short period of uh, treatment, but the composite of major and clinically relevant non-major bleeding was reduced by 50% with when we look at both doses of asundexian compared with pixaban and reduced with each of the individual doses, both the higher dose and the lower dose. Likewise, minor bleeding was reduced and all bleeding was reduced. So clearly a nice safety signal for asundexian compared to a pixaban. I don't know about the UK, but I can tell you in North America, Apixaban is the most frequently prescribed uh, DOAC. There was also an, an evaluation of the extent of factor 11A inhibition. And you can see at peak levels, both doses of asundexian were associated with an over 90% reduction in factor 11A activity and even a trough with the higher dose, it was over 90% inhibition. The next uh, study was the Pacific Stroke Study. This focused on pa patients with non-cardioembolic ischemic stroke. So remember that about 25% of ischemic strokes are cardioembolic in 
origin, and the remainder are non-cardioembolic. So this is a very uh, large group of strokes. The study enrolled patients with non-cardioembolic stroke or with TIAs that were associated with uh, an infarct on brain imaging. And patients were randomized to one of three doses of asundexin, either 10, 20, or 50 milligrams once a day, or to placebo. All patients received either single or dual antiplatelet therapy. So this asundexin or placebo on top of antiplatelet therapy. Now the primary outcome was the dose response effect on the composite of recurrent symptomatic strokes or covert strokes that were detected on repeat brain imaging. There was no significant difference in the primary efficacy outcome with asundexian versus placebo. The composite, as I said, of this is symptomatic stroke or covert stroke. However, there was a reduction in symptomatic ischemic stroke, 20% reduction in symptomatic ischemic stroke, about a 40% reduction in symptomatic ischemic stroke and TIA. And if the post hoc analysis drilled on down on patients who had extra or intracranial atherosclerosis as their underlying disease, there was an even greater reduction in the risk of, uh, of, of stroke, of symptomatic stroke. And a very nice uh, safety signal in that there was really uh, no increase in uh, bleeding, or oh, no significant increase in bleeding, including uh, hemorrhagic transformation of the index stroke. And this is using asundexin, remember, on top of antiplatelet therapy. The final study with asundexin looked at patients with AMI and about uh, 1,600 such patients randomized to placebo or again, the 10, 20, or 50 milligram dose of asundexian. Here, the, the, the agents were given on top of mostly dual antiplatelet therapy, and 87% of the patients on dual anti th uh, antiplatelet therapy received potent P2Y12 inhibitors, mostly ticagrelor. The primary outcome was bleeding. And if we look at uh, BARC 2, 3, or 5 bleeding, this is equivalent to major and clinically relevant non-major bleeding. There was no significant increase in bleeding uh, with asundexin compared with placebo, although the rate was 10.5% with the highest dose of asundexin versus 9% with placebo. The study was underpowered for efficacy. The efficacy of one outcome was a composite of cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, or stent thrombosis, and there was no obvious reduction with asundexin compared with placebo. The next oral factor 11A inhibitor is milvexium. Again, a small molecule binds reversibly to the active site of factor 11A. After oral administration, levels peak in about three hours. It has a half-life of 11 to 18 hours. So it could be given once a day, but it is being investigated as a twice-daily agent. The phase two program looked at its utility in patients undergoing knee replacement surgery and for secondary prevention in stroke. In the uh, stroke study, the doses that were evaluated range from 25 milligrams once a day 
to 200 milligrams twice a day. So a wide, wide range of, of uh, doses. The primary outcome was the, again, the composite of symptomatic recurrent ischemic stroke and covert, covert brain infarcts. And there was no significant change with with uh, milvexian compared with placebo. There also was no significant increase in bleeding. Once again, however, all doses of milvexian, except for the highest dose, were associated with a significant reduction in the, with a reduction in the risk of recurrent ischemic stroke of a symptomatic stroke. So if we put the results of the two studies together and look only at the symptomatic stroke recurrence, you see a, about a 40% reduction in, this, in the risk of recurrent stroke with the factor 11A inhibitors compared with placebo. So where do we stand? Now, we have three agents that are currently undergoing phase three evaluation. Two of them are the oral agents, asyndexian and mavexian. The other is the antibody, abilasimab. This is the antibody that binds to factor 11, so to the zymogen, and prevents factor 11 activation by factor 12a and by thrombin. It's being investigated in patients with atrial fibrillation who are deemed unsuitable for oral anticoagulation in the lilac TIMI 76 study, where it's being compared with placebo. So this study is addressing that unmet need that we have 30 or 40% of AF patients who aren't deemed suitable for the current generation of anticoagulants. And such patients are now being randomized to abilasimab or to placebo. And this study follows on the recent announcement by the uh, Anthos, the sponsor of the trial, that in the Azalea study, they name all their trials after flowers, in the Azalea study, which was a phase two study, comparing two doses of abilasimab with rivaroxaban in patients with atrial fibrillation, about 2,000 patients were enrolled. The study was stopped early because of an overwhelming reduction in the risk of major and clinically relevant non-major bleeding with abilasimab compared with rivaroxaban and a significant reduction in major bleeding compared with rivaroxaban as well. And we'll hear the results of that study at the American Heart Association meeting uh, next month. The Aster and Magnolia studies are comparing abilasimab with apixaban or daltaparin in patients with cancer-associated VTE. The Aster study, where it's being compared with apixaban, is focusing on patients with cancer-associated VTE who are not at high risk for bleeding. And the Magnolia study, which compares abilasimab with daltaparin, is comparing the two in patients who are at high risk for bleeding, particularly those with gastrointestinal or genitourinary cancers. Asundexian is being compared with apixaban in the Oceanic AF trial. And for secondary stroke prevention, asundexian is being compared with placebo. And uh, in this study, all patients will receive background antiplatelet therapy. The Milvexian program also is looking at Milvexian in atrial fibrillation and non-cardioembolic stroke. Again, in the Librexia AF trial, Milvexian is being compared with apixaban. In the secondary stroke prevention trial, it's being compared with placebo on top of antiplatelet therapy. Milvexian is also being evaluated 
in patients with acute coronary syndrome. So here it's being compared with placebo on top of antiplatelet therapy that might start out as dual antiplatelet therapy and transition to single antiplatelet therapy. And the idea here is that with extended factor 11 inhibition in such patients, we might see the early reduction in recurrent ischemic uh, events that was seen in the ATLAS ACS trial with low-dose rivaroxaban, and the extended reduction in cardiovascular events that was seen in the COMPASS trial. So a very exciting study there. So what are the take-home messages? Factor 11 is a promising target for new anticoagulants, and we have a number of different agents that are being evaluated to target factor 11. We need the results of these phase three trials to establish it, to establish the benefit risk profile of these factor 11 inhibitors, whether they are com being compared with a pixaban in the atrial fibrillation program or with placebo in the other programs. I think stepping back, the DOAX are now going generic. Apixaban is now generic in Canada and the cost has come down considerably. The DOAX are effective and safe. So I think it's gonna be a high bar to expect the factor 11 inhibitors to replace DOAX but I think they will find indications in the highest risk patients, whether these be patients with atrial fibrillation or with disorders where we haven't gone before with the DOAX, such as secondary stroke prevention in non-cardiomolic stroke or as adjuncts to antiplatelet therapy in patients with acute coronary syndrome. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you. That was absolutely a brilliant presentation. It's great to see how much work is ongoing in this area and hopefully we'll soon have safer agents um, available for those patients who are being under or not treated at all, as you've clearly said. Um, just a reminder to everyone to start putting your um, questions in the chat. We have got one early question already. So I'll start with that. It says, thank you for a great presentation. Can I please ask about extremes of body weight? And I guess given the experience in DOAX, it'd be right. good to know how they're managing that. Right. Well, there are no uh, body weight cutoffs and uh, the, the, the doses of milvexian and asundexian that are being carried forward. And those, if you look on uh, the clinical trial registries, you will see that the doses aren't being revealed. So I won't give away anything here, but the doses have been chosen such that they are, uh, they will cover extremes of body weight. Now, the low body weight, if we talk about the pediatric population, the very low body weight, that will be a separate program. But for Adults, I, I don't think it's going to be an issue with these agents. It, it could be an issue with some of the antibodies, but even that, the antibodies are cover a wide range of body weight. So I don't think that's going to be an issue. And as we're learning more and more about the DOAX, that body, upper body weight cutoff is, is probably more of a myth than a reality. Thank you. Um, got a few more questions coming through. There's, there's probably along a similar vein. So it says, could you please share your experience with renal impairment or deranged liver function? Okay, great Perhaps question. Start with that. Yeah, so the, uh, of course the antibodies and the antisense oligonucleotide are not cleared through the kidneys. So kidney dysfunction it will not affect their, the drug levels. And that is why uh, the antisense oligo and 
Asosumab have been evaluated in patients with end stage kidney disease. And we haven't seen the phase two results, but they will be coming out very, very shortly. Uh, the oral agents show less renal clearance than our current band of DOEX. So remember of the DOEX, Apixaban has about 25% of the drug is cleared unchanged through the kidneys, and it's probably less than 20% with Melvexian and probably even less with Asundexian. And hepatic metabolism, Melvexian is metabolized through the CYP3A4 system, but Asundexian is not. So again, there might be some drug-drug interactions with asundexian similar to those that we see with apixaban, but those are unlikely to be an issue with asundexian. So I think we're going to see some differentiation there, but you know, really in my practice, renal impairment isn't much of a barrier to the use of the DOAX. The DOAX are licensed down to creatinine clearances of 15 mLs per minute. And there's more and more comfort about using them, even with people who have slightly lower creatinine clearances. But these antibodies and the antisense oligonucleotide had promise for those people who perhaps are on dialysis. Can I ask, this is a, sort of a personal interest of mine. What about patients with liver disease or cirrhosis that were often excluded from the DOAC studies? Are we going to see any inclusion of those patients with the factor 11 inhibitors? I, I think not because those patients, as you know, are so complex, right? They, you know, they, they have cirrhosis, portal hypertension, esophageal varices that may have bled and uh, they are a challenge no matter what we use. So down the line, we might see targeted studies, but they're such a heterogeneous group, it's gonna be hard to study those patients. So no, I don't think that they're going to be included in the, in the trials. Thank you. Um, just coming back to the questions in the chat, um, someone's asking, do the factor 11 inhibitors affect platelets? They don't uh, directly affect platelets, but of course, uh, we know that uh, in the trials in say cancer associated venous thromboembolism with the DOAX, patients with platelet counts below 50,000 or in one study, the Caravaggio said below 75,000 were excluded. So in general patients with thrombocytopenia will be excluded from these trials. But down the line, it's quite possible that factor 11 inhibitors might be safer in patients who have thrombocytopenia than the current, currently available agents, but that won't be evaluated in this first set of studies. So just thinking then about the cancer um, associated VTE studies, would patients who are likely to, to develop cytopenias related to their treatment be excluded from those studies? No, not no. They they don't they don't have to be excluded. We would, uh, you know, if you if you think right now the only agent that's being studied in those patients is abilasimab. Abilasimab is given aside from the first dose, which is given intravenously to get rapid factor 11 inhibition. Subsequent doses are given once a month subcutaneously. So if a patient becomes thrombocytopenic, you can't do much. So we'll get an idea of whether there are bleeding events when they become thrombocytopenic or not. And, uh, you know, for the for the comparators, well, the, with daltaparin, you can adjust the dose of daltaparin for thrombocytopenia. For apixaban, you know, you're going to hold the apixaban 
when the platelet count goes below 50,000. So we'll get some information about the safety of factor 11 inhibition because it's a long acting 11 inhibitor and there won't be an adjustment. One of the things that's coming out now in the Azalea study, for example, which was the phase two study comparing abelacemab in two different doses with, uh, with rivaroxaban in patients with atrial fibrillation, and in the end-stage kidney disease study that we did with asosumab compared with placebo. As you can imagine that in both populations, there are patients who required procedures or surgery. And in the uh, end-stage kidney disease population, patients underwent kidney transplantation with full factor 11 inhibition and didn't bleed. And in the Azalea study, patients underwent surgery. And I think in over 250 such cases, there was one patient who got a single dose of factor 7A. And that's just because the surgeon thought there may be a little bit more bleeding. So I think we're gonna see a different paradigm here in periprocedural management in that we may not need to stop the drug for lots of simple procedures. And even in more serious procedures, the risk of bleeding may be lower. That's, that's very reassuring early data, isn't it? I'm sure. It's early data. Nice. And we're going to get, uh, you know, if you add up the number of patients that will be enrolled in those phase three trials that I put up on that second last slide, it's about 78,000 patients. So we're going to have a huge database of information on factor 11 inhibition. There's a couple of um, slightly related um, questions, which the answer might be what you've just given, but one saying, what would, what would you do in the life-threatening bleeding scenario? That's a great question. And, and the, the, the point is it depends on, you know, what the type of bleed might be. I think that for bleed, bleed, uh, bleeding management, Tranexamic acid is a go-to agent in people with congenital factor 11 deficiency, and it would be an agent that I would use there. And if there really is a life-threatening bleed, it depends a bit on which inhibitor the patient is on. If they were on the antisense oligonucleotide, their factor 11 levels are lower, you could replace the factor 11 with plasma, or a factor 11 concentrate. With the other agents, replacement isn't gonna work, but bypass would be the go-to approach. And you can bypass factor 11 inhibition with low doses of factor 7A. Thank you. Um, and again, slightly related, but someone's asking, are there any specific populations who you would want to monitor and how would you monitor them in terms of which assay? Jeez. Well, what, one of the things that's different about the 11 inhibitors compared with the DOACs is that if you did an activated partial thromboplastin time, all of the agents prolong the APTT. So you can tell whether they're on it or not by simply doing an APTT. They don't have any effect on the prothrombin time. Can you... Do you need to monitor? If you're monitoring because you'd want to dose adjust, that won't be required. But if you want to know whether they're on it or not, the PTT will tell you. That makes management a bit easier than the current situation yeah. with the directoral anticoagulants. Doesn't it? it also makes the clinical trials more complicated because if we're trying to do a double blind trial compared with a Pixaban, we have to discourage the local investigators from measuring a PTT because that would unblind them. Mm. Yeah, I can see how that would be difficult, particularly in some of those patients. I guess the renal population possibly have their clotting tested more often than, than other patients. But we'll, we'll see, I guess, in the results. Um, 
there's another question here, it might be too early to answer this, but are there any differences in the factor 11 agent, uh, anti-factor 11 agents when treatment is given as prophylaxis versus treatment? Yeah, it's just too early to tell. I think the atrial fibrillation studies, we have the two agents compared with a pixaban in those trials. So that'll be an interesting finding, but we're gonna get back to where we were with the DOACs compared with warfarin. We have agents, we have trials comparing the different DOACs with warfarin, but we have very little in the way of head-to-head -head comparison of the DOACs with each other. So I don't think we're gonna get head-to-head -head comparisons, but we will have trials in atrial fibrillation and in secondary stroke prevention where the oral factor 11 inhibitors are being compared with a PIC span or compared with placebo on top of antiplatelet therapy. Thank you. Um, and there's a question here that's slightly outside the remit of the talk, but be interested to hear your views about how do, how do you manage or how would you treat patients with liver disease who need anticoagulants? Do you use the direct oral anticoagulant? Yeah, I, I, I do. Uh, you know, it really depends on the severity of the liver disease. And with some patients who have severe liver disease and have uh, ongoing variceal bleeding and repeated variceal bleeding, you know, we have to, we walk a tightrope. And some of these patients, I just, if I really need to anticoagulant, I use titrated doses of low molecular heparin. Occasionally, if their liver disease is less severe, I will use the DOAX. Thank you. Um, I think that's brought us to the end of all of those questions. And a lot of mine have been covered by people in the audience. I have just got a couple of others, if, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, just in terms of the populations being tested, um, again, another area of interest to me is prevention of ET in hospitalized patients. And we know that a great majority of those events occur after discharge. And there's been interested in, in particularly in the acutely ill medical patients in offering an extended duration, which is, although there's been benefits, that's been offset by an increased risk of bleeding. I just wondered whether you thought there might be a role for the factor 11 inhibitors in those patients. Uh, I do. I, I totally agree with everything you just said. And just think about it, if we took, say, abelacemab as an example, because we're gonna have quite a lot of information on it. One dose of abelacemab would give 30 days of thromboprophylaxis. So for extended out of hospital prophylaxis, an agent like that would be ideal. And yeah, we're trying to encourage uh, the company to consider a medically ill thromboprophylaxis type trial, just for the reasons you said. Great, thank you. And there's a lot of um, attendees passing on their thanks to you for an excellent presentation in the Q&A as well. Um, I think we've covered everyone's questions, so I will bring this to a close now. Um, again, I'd like to very much thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today on World Thrombosis Day. Um, and it's very exciting to hear about these studies and the ongoing program of work planned. Um, I think it would really be um, practice changing if we did have an anticoagulant that, that was not associated with an increased risk of bleeding, particularly for those high risk patient groups. Um, so just before we close, I'd like to thank everyone who's joined this session and contributed to the discussion and also for your attendance throughout the four day meeting. Um, I'd particularly like to thank Joe, the organizers, all the faculty and sponsors of the meeting. And they're all really key to the success um, of the Let's Talk Clots. Um, and finally, Thrombosis UK will be in touch to request your feedback and provide certificates. I think all of the pre presentations will remain online for four weeks, so you're able to go back and watch any that you've missed. Um, so thanks again and happy World Thrombosis Day.